Well, Ed and the steam crew and the big boy, 4014, are on the move. The westward bound tour has begun. And they should be arriving Rock Springs somewhere around 3 p.m. today. The train will be in a position where you can easily see it, but you won't be able to get right up to it unless you're a UP employee or if you happen to be the guest of a UP employee. So if you know anybody that works for the UP, you might want to try to talk them into going over there. The train should be arriving 3 p.m. on July 3rd in Evanston, Wyoming. Here again, no public access, but it will be parked there on China Mary Road, and you can see it from the road. And again, if you know a UP employee, you can get right up to the locomotive. Anyway, a subject keeps coming up. Uh, how come the big boy, and for that matter, a lot of the big steam engines uh, that travel around, always travel with a diesel behind the steam locomotive? As always, there is a good deal of misinformation on the internet, but there are several reasons why you will almost always see a diesel locomotive behind the steam locomotive and its three tenders. Some of the misinformation is that the diesel is actually pulling the train and it's only pushing the steam locomotive, uh, which isn't really operating, it's just fake. In this particular case, the diesels were pushing the big boy. This is back when the big boy was being moved to Cheyenne for restoration. That is the only time that the steam locomotive was actually being pushed by, or in this case, pushed and pulled by the diesel locomotives. For reference, let's just take a quick look at the controls. This is uh, the cab of 844, just so we can get a sense of this. This is the throttle, this big handle here, that puts steam into the system and makes the train go forward or reverse. Uh, the controls over here First up, we have uh, the Johnson bar, which controls the timing of the valves and will determine uh, what direction the locomotive is going, but also how much steam it's using. Over here, we have the train brake. There are two different braking systems on these locomotives, the train brake and over here, an independent locomotive brake. It's very important when operating a train to be able to control the brakes separately between the train and the head end, the locomotive, so that you can uh, cause the train to bunch up behind the locomotive or stretch out behind the locomotive, controlling the slack in the train. Here we can see the uh, pressure valves for the two separate air braking systems. Over here we can see some of the electronics that have been added to the locomotive. This is the control panel that runs the throttle of the diesel locomotive. You can put it in any of the various throttle notches, one through eight. We also have a direction control and an emergency stop uh, in order to put the entire train into an emergency stop. So one of the functions of the diesel locomotive at the head end is dynamic braking. The brake shoes on the steam locomotives are insanely expensive. Back in the day, of course, they could replace those out easily in the locomotive shop. Not so much anymore. These have to be custom made. And I believe Ed said that it costs $25,000 to put new brake shoes on uh, the big boy. And that was quite some time ago. I'll bet it's twice that much today. Anyway, what is dynamic braking on diesel locomotives? Of course, diesel locomotives are diesel electric. The diesel engine generates electrical power. The electrical power runs electric motors, uh, traction motors mounted to the axles of the locomotive, which is what makes the locomotive go forward. Well, for dynamic braking, those motors are used as generators generating electricity, which is routed to huge resistors mounted in the roof of the locomotive. That resistance creating uh, 
drag on the motors and causing pretty dramatic braking of the locomotive without applying any brake shoe pressure whatsoever. So this allows the uh, steam locomotive engineer to uh, utilize head-end braking without wearing out the brakes on the steam locomotive whatsoever, saving them a lot of money and a lot of work. The Union Pacific requires that all of their trains have dynamic braking, and so you're not going to go out on the, the line with a steam locomotive without a diesel engine to provide dynamic braking. There is, of course, the much more obvious use of the diesel locomotive, and that's to provide a little extra traction or horsepower when needed, and that will extend the range of the entire train. It's difficult to get fuel, water, and sand into the steam locomotive back in the day. Of course, that was quite simple. There were uh, fuel in uh, water tanks and uh, sand towers all along the line. Not anymore. It's quite a challenge to meet a fuel truck somewhere, connect with uh, a fire department perhaps, and find some way to get water into the train, and then getting sand into the locomotive is really a job. The gigantic blisters on top of the boiler contain sand, tons of sand, which can be applied to the rails just ahead of the drive wheels when the drive wheels are slipping. Well, getting the sand up there uh, used to just be done with a, a tower that drained sand into the top of the locomotive. Anymore, you have to hand feed that out of bags from a forklift. So someone has to ride a forklift, open 50 pound bags of sand and dump those in there until you achieve several tons worth of sand in the locomotive. So you don't really want to use that sand if you can find some other way to gain traction. And the easy way to do that is just inch up on the, the throttle of the diesel engine uh, if the wheels on your steam locomotive start to slip. And rather than pound the equipment trying to pull a heavy grade, uh, in order to save wear and tear on these precious locomotives when needed uh, pulling a grade also add a little power from the diesel engine. Hotel power. What we mean by this is uh, how do you power a passenger train? A passenger train needs a lot of electricity to run all of the equipment in the actual passenger cars. And uh, on some railroads, not the Union Pacific, that electricity is being generated by the diesel locomotive and then fed to the passenger train. On the Union Pacific, you will notice that there is always a car somewhere in the consist that has gigantic diesel generators in it, and that's providing the hotel power. But on uh, some railroads, you'll find that the diesel engine is also providing the hotel power to the passenger train. Back in the earlier days, a lot of the passenger cars had uh, coal heat and uh, kerosene lighting and so on. And as they were converted to electricity, a lot of them carried a generator on board each car. But in a few cases, the steam locomotives themselves would also provide the hotel power, just like they do on a more modern diesel train. One example of this is one of our great favorite railroads, the Nevada Northern. Nevada Northern number 40 has a generator on board that provides the hotel power to the passenger train and, and did back in the early 20th century. And now one of the most modern and exotic uses for the diesel locomotive has been positive train control, PTC. Uh, the government passed regulations some years ago requiring all trains on railroads to carry positive train control. If the computers detect that the train is doing something dangerous, something that uh, indicates the train is out of control, then the positive train control can shut the train completely down and bring it to a stop. And again, under FRA regulations, that's now required on all trains on Class A railroads. 
And so the Union Pacific has installed this on their two steam locomotives out of necessity. However, the electronics for these systems is uh, entirely located in the diesel locomotive. And this has uh, required that there be data lines running between the big boy and the diesel through the tenders. So there's a data bus running the whole length of the head end power to connect the computers in the diesel to the CPU in the steam locomotive because the controls for the computer still need to be in the cab of the steam locomotive. The most recent upgrades to 4014 include installing all of this electronic equipment inside 4014's tender. So now it's possible for 4014 to go out onto the main line without uh, the diesel locomotive in tow. They're not likely to do that for any long distance, but if they want to run 4014 on its own, they now have the ability to do that. The uh, computer screens, the, the CPUs and keyboards and so on, are still located in the locomotive as they were before. Also, there's a duplicate computer terminal in the train so that the conductor can also monitor the train's location, uh, see a map of the grade, what grades they're about to climb, what grade they may be traveling down. A lot of very, very valuable information for the train crew is now displayed on the computer screen. And now, again, it's all self-contained. And we, as rail fans, can access some of this information and have been able to for, for quite some time by going on to uh, Union Pacific Railroad Steam Program Tracker. Just Google UPRR Steam Program Tracker and it will take you to this screen where you can watch the locomotive moving. And that will help you plan where you want to meet the locomotive to get video or photographs or whatever. rate by the time uh, you see this video after it's posted we will probably be out on uh, the line somewhere chasing the locomotive and having a grand time and we're hoping that a lot of people are also out following the locomotive around if you're not a subscriber to the channel please subscribe and you might also consider joining which will send a couple of dollars our way it really helps out because uh, the ad revenues here on YouTube have all but completely evaporated. So you might want to please consider clicking the join button. But at the very, very least, please click the upcoming subscribe button. Zoink! Right there, the subscribe button. Well, we're not sure how you found this video on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you here on Sunday. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.